So thank you very much and welcome to the ministerial session. We call it a ministerial roundtable and our aim is to hear from the ministers as policy makers, interact with them. We are going to try to manage the time. So our session begins with a small presentation just to set the stage. I will invite the ministers one by one to come up to the podium and take their positions. They are going to speak to you for about three minutes each, after which I may have follow-up questions, and then I open the floor. And feel free to ask any questions or make a comment. The ministers are very disciplined. They are leading by example. They will do three minutes, and uh, you try to ask your question in about a minute. We will come back to you. So I, I plead with you. Emergence telecommunications, we are going through very difficult times. Climate change is wreaking havoc across the globe. Food security is a huge issue, as you can see. From 1964 to 2007, I can tell you that heat waves have cost the world food to the tune of a reduction of 10%. So we are less rich in terms of food than we were decades before 1964. And this is our problem. For those that come from small island developing states, the Deputy Prime Minister from Samoa, the Minister from Tuvalu, and many other countries, there is a huge challenge. Land size is shrinking. Climate change, mitigation, and adaptation is a critical element. The world has lost to the tune of about $1 trillion in terms of destruction as a result of sea rise. And as you can see, this video is basically showing you what has happened in terms of climate change. Uh, 2015, according to the results of Nature, Nature is a scientific magazine, uh, it has been recorded since records were kept as the hottest year in the world. As you can see, the trend does not look very good. So that which we cannot mitigate, we should adapt it to. I would say that 20-year review shows that pretty much 90% of the disasters are weather-related. So climate is a big issue. Climate change is a reality for you, for me, for us all. There is no country that is immune. Today, in Europe, there are many countries that are suffering from floods. And traditionally, floods don't happen during this time of the year. For those that have been watching the news, the United States of America is suffering from huge snowfalls and winds. And that has stopped some of the participants from coming to participate. Isn't it ironic? In Southern Africa and many other regions, drought is the theme of the day. It just it doesn't rain. Clouds are up the sky, but they are not pregnant to give birth to rain. And that's a huge challenge for us. Whatever it is, as we said yesterday, we believe in a multi-hazard, whether it is a super cyclone, whether it is floods, whether it is an earthquake, tsunami, whatever it is, technology is the master key. So it can unlock value out of that or it can lessen the impact of disasters. Impacts of disasters, 1.3 million lost lives 2000 to 2015. 2010, 2011 were the worst years, not only in terms of cost, but also in terms of human life, which was lost. One disaster in Port au Prince, in Haiti, 7.1 on the Richter scale, killed over 320,000 people in one instant. $3.2 billion lost as a result of natural disasters. Preparedness is better than response. 
I think it, it came through during the policy statements made this morning, and we do agree. Economic loss, $2.1 trillion over that decade. Again, 2011 was the most expensive year for the world. And I told you on average yesterday, for those who were here, on average, one disaster costs the country affected something to the tune of about $25 billion. And that money, if it plowed into development, it would make a huge difference in eradicating poverty. So we move on. The ITU approach is a very simple approach. We start from where it begins. We do hazard assessments. We use technology, remote sensing. I'm going to demonstrate to you and show you how we do it. And then we use remote sensing, active and passive remote sensing. We use geographical information systems. And we make sure that we, of course, monitor the environment in order to detect, predict, and be able to respond to natural disasters as they come. So we empower countries to make sure that they are technologically ready to respond. After that, we're going to preparedness, but before that, and as part of preparedness, we set up early warning systems. And the places where we have set up early warning systems, the response effort and the state of preparedness has been quite different. Katanduanes and Albani in the southern Philippines, in Uganda, we just launched two sites for early warning. In Zambia, we're just about to commission I could go on and go on and go on. When a disaster finally happens, we are ready to respond and help countries. For terrestrial networks destroyed or disrupted, we provide satellite communications and other means of communications, Tetra systems, radio trunking, and so forth. And I will show you now. Uh, if then it happens, of course, we have to join hands to make sure that we recover. ITU does a lot of things. One of the things, the legal framework. The chairman of this event mentioned today the Temporary Convention. So that is an international treaty to set up a legal framework. The regulators have a huge role to play, licensing the kind of equipment that comes in and goes out and making sure that they allocate spectrum. And spectrum management is a key issue. Operating procedures are critical. Who does what, when, in order to avoid confusion when the disaster does strike. We write and publish a lot of books. You go on our website, you'll find them on uh, how to organize yourselves, how to set up, and how to create operation centers and coordination centers. So we do a lot of things from policy to legal, legal to regulation. This is the tripartite arrangement that we have in place in terms of technology. One, we want to monitor what is happening on Earth. So we use satellites and we do remote sensing active and passive and we collect a lot of data, which is quite critical to monitor the environment, the sea rise, and anything that we think will impact human life. Second, we also use telecommunications to convey that information to wherever it is required, alerting, coordinate humanitarian action, setting up telemedicine uh, facilities to make sure that we convey the diagnosis made by a junior doctor that we train at the site of the disaster, send it thousands of kilometers to a specialist with somewhere else, and then he will direct a small operation, and that way we save human life. But we also need geographical information. We take a satellite map or a resolution before the disaster strikes. We know what was on the ground. We have the statistics. We have the population dispersion. And then we take a satellite after the disaster. We compare the two. Without going on the site, we can pretty much guesstimate and estimate the destruction. So we move on, and I'm about to conclude. That was the hybrid of technology that we use. And I can tell you now, we have a project. We are always moving. We are on the move. Established 1865, but adapting and acting as we were established in 2015. So what I want to tell you is that we are embracing big data and I will show you a project briefly because you are going to have a clear demonstration of the work that we do. And that project is on Ebola. How you can trace a person infected with Ebola, where they are going, but making sure we anonymize and protect the details of the individual consent. So privacy is a critical issue. Anonymization, visualization, analytics, and so forth. Uh, an integral part of the work that we do.
So let me just show you here in West Africa, the demo. We did this over a period, I hope you can see because, uh, okay, let me just go back a little bit. Can you play? So what we did, we took data, real data, we call it call data records, and we showed from midnight, you see people are sleeping. As it goes on, and you are coming to, end of the, to early morning, you can see more people are moving. You can tell without knowing exactly the person, but if the person is that center, which is a city, and they go to a village, it is easy for us to tell health workers, this person who came from an infected area, he has gone to this area, can you quarantine the people there and check them to make sure that there is no spread? It's more complex than this. And we have got dynamic maps that show you at any given time when that person went there, how many people were there. And this is an issue of correlation rather than being specific to know exactly who the person is. So what you see is a dot. You don't see a person in order to provide and to protect their privacy. The model and I'll take one minute. The model that ITU uses is called ITU Framework for Cooperation in Emergencies, IFCE, with the three pillars. One pillar is the technology pillar. We have partners that bring their technology to us and work with us to make sure that we deploy them in a timely manner and they save lives. Then we have a second pillar, which is the finance pillar. We build a fund. You heard the director of the BDT this morning saying, we are going to launch a massive fund to make sure that we respond rapidly where and when we have to intervene when disasters do strike. And the last one is the logistics pillar, which is basically bringing airline uh, people like DHL, FedEx and others who have offered in the past their services when we wanted to send equipment, some of them for free. And then we make sure within 24 hours or 48 hours we are at location and we deploy to those that need. So we operate on the basis of a multi-stakeholder approach. And uh, there is power in partnerships. So these are some of our key partners with whom we work. They are more than this. And we are building a co co coalition of the willing. And you too can become a partner of ITU. So the last slide, what do our ministers say? What is their vision? So allow me to invite the ministers to come and join me here. Let me invite HE Mr. Monise Lafay Tuvalo. Please, if you could come and join us. Can you join me in welcoming him, please? And followed by His Excellency Mr. Kapembwa Simbao, Zambia. Thank you. And uh, may I invite His Excellency Guled Kasim, Somalia? <clears throat> and I would like to invite His Excellency, Deputy Prime Minister of Tonga, Sovaleni, please. And I would like to invite His Excellency, Melford, Nicholas, Andigua, and Babulda. Please join me. Dr. Mlambo from Zimbabwe, Deputy Minister, ICT. Please, if you could join us. Fantastic. I think our panel is complete. I recognize the presence of uh, the Minister of Oman, uh, who will be sitting here. Thank you very much, sir, for coming. So, welcome. We are going to make this short and sweet. I would like to begin uh, from my right and invite the Minister of Andigua to give us uh, just a few remarks, three minutes, and then we will move on, and then uh, you will have an opportunity to interact with them. Your Excellency, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And Your Excellency, so I would like to uh, recognize all of the protocols previously established. Good day, everyone. I am happy to be here. Uh, not only do I represent Antigua and Barbuda, the country that I'm from, but I represent the wider Caribbean territories um, under the umbrella of the Caribbean Telecommunications Union. Uh, this is an important forum for us in the Caribbean. 
simply because as small island developing states, we are indeed vulnerable in many respects, not only because our economies are small and are in fact very uh, fragile, but we also are situated in the part of the world where almost on a too frequent basis, we are visited by tropical storms or hurricanes, as you would know. And with uh, climate change, the ferocity and intensity of these storms uh, have uh, you know, complicated planning and development in, in our part of the world. I can recall it was only recently in 1995 uh, that the most perfect storm that century um, had visited my own country and had sat and wreaked its destruction for a period of 36 hours. And you cannot imagine being pounded by a storm of over 145 miles per hour for 36 hours. And what it did and left the wake of destruction that it left, um, it took some while uh, to recover from that. But we're not only vulnerable to hurricanes. Uh, you would have been told and you have been mindful of the tragedy that befell Haiti in 2010 with the uh, the earthquake, and of course, more recently, the Commonwealth of Dominica that suffered um, some massive floods and loss of life and uh, damage to the infrastructure as a result of uh, the passage of another tropical storm. And in all of these, we are still mindful of the fact that uh, there are some active volcanoes in the Caribbean, uh, not only in Martinique, um, in St. Vincent, uh, in St. Lucia, and uh, certainly in Montserrat, back in 1995 as well, where full two-thirds of the country had to be evacuated because of the small size and because of the impact of the volcano, more than two-thirds of the population was displaced. So we have had our fair share of uh, disasters, uh, natural disasters. Uh, again, because of uh, the potential of earthquakes, there is a possibility that there could be the impact of of a tsunami. We haven't had uh, one of those as a result of any major earthquakes in the region, but it is still a possibility. And of course, the whole issue of the rising, uh, the, due to climate change, the issue and the impact that um, island states will have, coastal areas will have when the, the sea level rises. So these are some of the potential uh, hurdles that we have to overcome. Uh, we are served by uh, fiber systems, telecommunication systems on the sea in the Caribbean, and we are all interconnected into the Americas. And uh, there is redundancy and there is resiliency in those networks. But uh, ultimately, the looking at the adoption of the Tampere uh, Convention and uh, what we are now discovering is the Restoration Fund, these things will actually have um, some potential benefits for us in the Caribbean. So. I'm interested in learning as much as we possibly can from this forum and uh, certainly to uh, take back with us for further deliberations in the Caribbean as we improve our planning and development process. So with those few words, I'd just like to say I'm happy to be here and I look forward to the rest of the deliberations. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Your Excellency. Uh, we would like later on to hear from you concerning the disaster insurance in the Caribbean, because you are one region that has managed to set up this kind of a funding mechanism. So later on, when we come back, we we'll would be glad to, to listen to you. I would like to go to the Minister of Somalia. Somalia is a least developed country. Somalia has stabilized. Can you tell us? Uh, could you share your thoughts? You are the only country that I know that has spent over 13 years without a, a telecom regulator authority, but at one of the highest growth rates in ICTs. Does it mean regulation is not necessary? <laughs> uh, to answer the question, uh, no. Regulation is an absolute necessity, but first of all, um, I'd like to essentially extend a warm greeting uh, to everyone uh, from the people and the government of Somalia, uh, President, Prime Minister, uh, Cabinet, Parliament, and so forth. I, I think the, the and, and actually uh, similarly um, extend a thanks uh, to our hosts uh, for this wonderful facility, 
uh, for the gracious way that we've been welcomed, uh, and certainly for ITU for putting together this very important uh, conference. Ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, I wish you good morning. Uh, you know, we, we must observe these protocols, and it's actually good. Um, you know, in Somalia, I guess, uh, to, just to answer that question and use that, we've had a, we've had a, a unique experience the past uh, 25 years or so. Uh, we went from having a government that was not only the regulator, but also the actual uh, operator, uh, telecommunications operator. It was very much centrally run. And obviously in 1991, uh, the government dissolved. And, and so what had happened was the, the people, the community at large, uh, now the disaster that we experienced for a good decade really uh, was man-made. And I think, you know, we, 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 we uh, in the parts of the world where resources are, are very little, uh, man-made disasters also have to factor into the response. And for us, what it has done was it forced the community, uh, it forced operators to come from nowhere. Uh, the operators for about 10, 15 years now have, have done a wonderful job of self-regulating, sharing spectrum. Um, you know, some are stronger than others. Uh, but at the end of the day, you need a regulator to uh, divvy out the spectrum in a fair way. And obviously, when it comes to emergency management preparation, we certainly need a, a government body to do that. Uh, in Somalia, we've, we've really done a lot in the last 12 months since I've been minister. Uh, we have refined and fine-tuned the telecom law. It's actually being voted this week, so uh, I need your blessings and good luck. Hopefully, you will pass. Um, you spent a tremendous amount of time uh, on the telecom law. Um, to make sure that it had all the requisite uh, elements that allowed us to, S, to, to scale up. Uh, it, gener it creates the uh, regulatory body, uh, the telecom uh, agency. It uh, uh, mandates that the, this agency will then begin to divvy up the spectrum in a fair and, and, and equal way, and, and along other things that, that are necessary. We're also breaking ground in a month or two on a national data center, uh, which will allow us, uh, as we look into emergency mitigation, uh, along with uh, sector monitoring, uh, allow us to actually look forward. Now, if, without taking too much time, I'll just stay on this question. One, one last point. You know, the, the, the important part of having a government is beyond uh, regulations. It is, it is to extend the level of confidence in the society that should this happen, uh, we have the plans, the wherewithal, uh, at the very, very minimum, those of us who don't have a lot of resources, um, we are aware. So in, in 2004, the tsunami, believe it or not, Somalia is at the end of Indian Ocean. The tsunami hit Somalia. It was loss of life, loss of livestock. Uh, the vast majority of our population lives right on the coast. Uh, as you all may know, Somalia has the longest coastline in Africa. Uh, so much of the population is on the coast. So rising seawaters impacts us. Drought situation impacts us. The El Nino effect now where we've had both drought and floods uh, of, of, of the rivers. And what we've done, and this is the last point that I'll make uh, in terms of our experience, we are looking to build a cross-sectoral strategy uh, that has multi-purpose use. So we, we don't want a system that sits on a shelf in the event of a tsunami. Uh, we want something that we're constantly using. And, and police, firefighters, first responders will tell you the more they practice, the better they get at it. Uh, and, and Somalis are very good at communicating. Uh, so we, we are building a national ICT infrastructure plan that is constantly used. And what that does is allows us uh, to overcome any glitches in the system because we're using it on a regular basis and allows us to uh, use it and be more and more uh, um, familiar with it. So with that, I'll close. But again, uh, very, very delighted to be here. And certainly thank you all uh, for
allowing us to have the opportunity. Thank you very much, Excellency, uh, for your insights. Uh, some say what nature has given us, we can't change. We say what God has given us, we don't change, but we can improve and work around it. Dr. Mlambo, you come from a landlocked country, Zimbabwe. What are your thoughts? Um, <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Yes, I know time is tight, but um, let me appreciate the hospitality from the host country to wait through their uh, representatives who are here. Also want to recognize the Secretary General of ITU and also of ATU uh, who are here and uh, the chairman of this GET 2016. Um, in my intervention, I will tilt uh, very much towards uh, Zimbabwe and uh, also developing countries because I would like to make specific recommendations at the end to ITU and um, developers of equipment over here. Um, Zimbabwe has had a fair share of uh, disasters. They are not too very, very large in comparison to the size of tsunami, but the destruction because of lack of preparedness um, is also great. Um, but let me look at policy as a jacket within which um, emergency operations when disaster strike are supposed to operate. The margin within which they can be enabled to, to operate without, um, with least inconveniences. That is the key role that policy in ICT should play. The emergency numbers. What is the policy within that country um, with regards to the use of emergency numbers? Do they adequately and efficiently uh, reach out to emergency centers and also invoke a rapid response to save lives? Uh, this is the importance of policy when it comes to emergency centers. Tempera Convention really captures it all. Well, when I read it through, the objective was to try and waive some of these um, regulations that might inhibit rapid response. We, we come back to policy now, that it is very important that in crafting policy, we, we, we leave out enough margin to take care of uh, emergent services to save life. Um, now, the, in terms of resilience, if, um, again, from a basic, we want to remain basic here, which might sound very strange to develop the countries because they are far, far ahead in terms of um, the uh, implementation, uh, preparedness, and everything else. They are far ahead. But uh, coming to develop the countries, let's go back to basics. Um, we want to do the drills. We want to, to simulate throughout. Let's not wait for uh, an announcement of a disaster, or sometimes as it so happens in develop, developing countries, you, you, you wake up and you see you are under attack of a disaster because of lack of preparedness. We must, um, if we have pieces of equipment, like in Zimbabwe, we were uh, very grateful that we had an issue of a number of iridium sets in 20, um, 2008. Now, when we look through, they were not um, trained enough, the operators trained enough of, uh, with regard to these um, very useful handset satellite based. They were not. But since that time, we, th th there wasn't any attempt to practice on how to respond to disaster using the, the sets. Because as um, the rapporteur has observed, when it strikes, even if we have a fair coverage of network, mobile network, um, operations in our country, but th those are destroyed uh, from power lines, uh, base stations, when uh, floods come in. They are destroyed. So we might then revert to satellite communications to save lives in there. Has there been enough training? Has there been enough awareness um, to make sure that we prepare 
people who are going to in those communities. Now there's no simulations, especially where a lot of stakeholders are involved. In Zimbabwe, between 11 and 12 stakeholders are involved to handle a disaster. To coordinate and have coherence when a disaster strikes is very, very difficult. It requires simulations and, 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 and so forth um, during peace times. But um, it, you see, again, trying to be very basic in the remaining one minute, we have a number of conferences which have been attended. Um, allow me to mention some of them. Uh, we, we have the uh, Sendao, obviously, um, a conference that was um, attended. We have um, the Rio Declaration. We have the um, a temporary convention, which I've mentioned earlier on. We have the Yokohama a Strategy for a Safer World, the United Nations in 2012, Future We Want. We have the Yogo Framework for Action. When you scan through, just a case of look at all these conventions, there is massive information uh, that each conference dishes out to participants. But um, again, talking from the context of developing countries, very little of that massive in information has been implemented. If we just make an effort to implement just 10% of uh, that information, that will go a long way in alleviating disaster and saving lives. And perhaps it forward towards the 17 goals, sustainable goals 2030. Uh, but we, in my view again, we, we call upon those who manufacture equipment and I see to you, given the, a lot of work they are doing, to perhaps focus now on encouraging developing countries to start implementing what we talk about. Like, when we leave this conference here, is there an honest effort to go and implement what we have learned? Because some of it we have heard from these multiple conferences which we have held before. So perhaps ITU and uh, other develop, the developed world can then assist the developing countries from being aware of the need to take effort to implement what we learn, rather than come back again to wait for another conference and hear the same thing. I thank you very much. Your Excellency, Deputy Prime Minister, welcome again. We are grateful you joined us in, uh, in Hiroshima, where you spoke eloquently about the role of measuring the information society. Your country is a small island developing state. It is a least developed country. It is doing well. Uh, can you share with us what you are doing right? Because I know you are also vulnerable to climate change, and natural disasters, but we know that each time you have tended to stumble, you have risen uh, rapidly. Please, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, moderator. Uh, on behalf of the government of Tonga and the people of Tonga, I'd like to actually thank the government of Kuwait uh, and ITU for hosting this very important and timely meeting. Um, I'm very honored to be here uh, in, in Kuwait City. Uh, and. Um, I, I, I believe that uh, it's not about sharing what we do well, but uh, learning uh, what we can do about the mistake that we have done. You know, actually learning from, from my fellow colleagues here in the panel. Tonga, as, as you mentioned, uh, moderator, is, is a small island developing state, and my colleague from the Caribbean have uh, uh, raised some of the difficulties that we face, the challenges like tyranny of distance. For example, Tonga is a small country, we have about 200 islands. Our population is dispersed over about 50 small islands. Uh, for telecos to actually provide uh, services in some of this stuff doesn't make sense financially because they're too small. The, the amount uh, of investment needed to actually provide services in some of these small islands doesn't make sense financially. So we, we uh, continuously have to look at, at, uh, at, 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 at means of actually trying to provide services in some of these vulnerable islands. 
Tonga uh, is one of the more vulnerable ones in uh, small island developing states. Uh, uh, for example, in the last three weeks, from the 1st of January up to now, we have had two cyclones, category three cyclones. So that's only, you know, January. We've got another three more months in our cyclone season. So that just highlights the, the, the vulnerability of, of uh, Tonga as in most small island developing states. Uh, I believe that the Secretary General actually mentioned uh, in his speech early this morning the fact that uh, uh, for us in, in a small island developing state, and I'm sure in other developing states, uh, most of our development progress can be wiped out in a matter of hours by some of these uh, natural hazards like cyclones or earthquakes or tsunami. So in, in Tonga's case, we pay a lot of emphasis in building our resilience. I'll, I'll give you an example. 30% of our development assistance goes into building our resilience. And I think a moderator actually mentioned earlier today uh, that the return on building your, resi your resilience is around about if you, if you invest it one dollar, you probably get, you probably save about $24 in post-disaster losses. Uh, in, in other venues, well, like in Sendai, World Bank was quoting saying for every dollar that you spend on preparing, on, on uh, building your resilience, you save $36. So there's definite rationale there to actually put more emphasis on building your resilience. In the ICT side, uh, in the sector, uh, what we tend to do is actually partner up with the telecos. We've got two telecos in Tonga uh, to actually make sure that what they put in a more a resilient ICT system that actually can take a category three, category four cyclones, uh, at least a category four. I mean, for example, in the last cyclone that we had in Tonga, category three, with about 100 to 200 kilometers per hour wind, uh, our system uh, was not, dis I mean, our mobile system were not disrupted. I mean, ideally, because we like to think that they've taken into account that we're going to take a few cyclones along the way and they build a system accordingly. Uh, but I, I think a lot of emphasis should be on preparedness. And, and in our case, because of the, of the environment uh, the, in Tonga, we, we tend to do it in a more a multi-pronged approach, whereby you use radio. Radio is still one of our main important tools, uh, but also the internet, using social media, and so forth, even uh, television. Uh, when we had that cyclone on the 1st of uh, January this year, we, we deploy all the tools. We put down radio programs, we put down uh, on, on Facebook and what have you. We also send out uh, uh, cell broadcasting, even SMS, uh, informing people, trying to reach as many people as we can uh, and telling them, hey, you got to get yourself prepared. There's a cyclone heading your way. There's a, a disaster, uh, uh, a sender nearby, you can evacuate there. So I, I believe that uh, you should be using all that you have uh, in your effort to actually get your people prepared because that will essentially, hopefully, uh, will uh, result in less uh, lives lost. In the legal re uh, framework, we, we have a, a, a legislation in place that established a national committee uh, in the event of a disaster, uh, whereby they're given certain authority to mobilize resources and so forth. I think that's a very important legislation to have. But we also ratified the Tempia Convention, uh, and we also have a relevant policy uh, in place to actually help with our response, whereby we set up clusters for health, clusters for shelter, clusters for food, getting all the relevant stakeholders into these clusters so they can make a proper decision in a timely manner. Uh, it doesn't make sense for you to start looking, who should I call to help with shelter? Who should I call to help with uh, water? Uh, it should have that in place be way before so that they can be, uh, uh, they can be called upon whenever, uh, whenever you need. Uh, I, I think, moderator, that covers pretty much you know, some of the key points, but you know, moving forward, Tonga is looking forward to uh, having a more efficient disaster management system, uh, pre-positioning some of the, of the tools like uh, set phone and stuff in, in some of these uh, uh, small islands. And, and, um, and, and look, make, making sure that we have a clear idea of what our different partners 
roles are in a case of a disaster. You know, what will be ITU's role? What will be FAO's role? What will be all the relevant uh, stakeholders? Uh, what will be their roles are? So that they know and we know what's expected. And I think that will be very helpful, uh, especially when time uh, is, is, uh, uh, is not on our side when we try to respond to a disaster. Thank you, uh, moderator. Thank you very much, Excellency. Let me move on to His Excellency Simbao from Zambia. Zambia, least developed country, landlocked country, very strategic. You moved the disaster management unit into the vice president's office to get political commitment and support, working with ITU continuously and incessantly and establishing an early warning system. We would like to hear from you. What do you think is the role of uh, political will and policy in the support of disaster management in general, particularly how you can marry ICTs and disaster management? Your Excellency, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Uh, to start with, I would like to commend the Kuwait government for the hospitality that they've shown to me and I believe all the other delegates who are here. And I would like to bring greetings from my president who sent me here to attend this particular conference. I want to say that uh, in regards to the question that you've raised, the disaster mitigation unit has been placed under the office of the vice president because we've had quite some disasters, maybe not at the same uh, 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 scale, as maybe uh, others, but in our case, the kind of disasters we've had are health-related as well as physical-related. The health-related uh, disasters have been emergencies of cholera that have taken lives and uh, big numbers of people have died. And uh, the physical-related disasters are what is happening now. Uh, in my country, we have two big problems, what we have called disasters. One, we have a deficit of electricity. Uh, that means that a lot of things cannot happen. For example, communication is affected. And now we've also got a drought, which, if we're not very careful, will result in deaths. Because the drought is very, very bad. It has affected the entire half of the country meaning this is our time to grow food and half of the country is not able to grow food. So these are the two most uh, biggest problems or disasters that our country faces. Now, in trying to mitigate this, it was found that if we put the office of the disaster mitigation unit under the office of the vice president, a lot of political will will be attached to this particular problem. And as such, what has happened is that the whole country is divided into districts and provinces. And all these have a unit of the disaster management unit under the vice president. The biggest problem that we have is that uh, we are not well connected by ICT. For example, we would love to have telephone conferences facilities or video conferencing facilities, but these are not very well established. Neither do we have the entire country covered by signal for communication. We don't have that. So what it is is that uh, when a disaster occurs in certain areas, it has to be a physical visit to that area to go and address that problem. Um, even though you might have experts in that area, but when they have issues, they cannot just pick up a phone and call and find out what they should do. They have to travel very long distances, uh, maybe a thousand kilometers or stuff like that, which eventually you find that the people that are in dire need don't get that particular attention and they die. We would like to appeal that maybe ITU can look into the costs 
of satellite fees such that uh, maybe if that is addressed concerning at least disasters, uh, that might be easy for countries like Zambia to easily reach other places and people that they need. At the moment, the satellite fees are really prohibitive for a country like ours. So we are very, very much concerned uh, with uh, uh, saving lives and, and we really appreciate that ITU uh, is equally concerned and they thought it necessary that they invite us and the other countries that I've seen here because I think we are the people that would like to see to it that our people are saved from these uh, disasters that can be mitigated. Thank you. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, uh, for your insights. We'll come back to you. I would like now to invite uh, His Excellency from Tuvalu, Tuvalu from the Pacific Islands, least developed country, and also a small island developing state. But like its neighbor, Samoa, it is just about to graduate from the list of least developed countries to become a developing country. Samoa has already graduated. So it's like flu, I understand it's uh, contagious. So Your Excellency, can you tell us what you are doing right? And we know you have been in the forefront uh, in raising awareness as to the negative impact of climate change. Uh, could you just give us your insights, please? Uh, thank you, moderator. Greetings from Tuvalu, uh, an island nation consisting of eight uh, low-lying atolls with a population of uh, about 12,000 people. Uh, but first let me <clears throat> I'll reiterate the warm sentiments already expressed by fellow panelists to ITU and uh, its partners, and, but perhaps much more so to uh, the government of Kuwait and the people of Kuwait for uh, having us here and for the warm hospitality uh, extended to us since our arrival in your beautiful country. Uh, why are we here? I think we are here because we, we made a commitment. We, we set ourselves a goal and that is saving lives in time of disaster. So the question is perhaps the more important question for us is are we getting any closer to achieving that goal? Or what is it that is preventing us from achieving that goal? Uh, because over the years we have discuss, we have talked about a lot of things. Uh, we, we have been using the same vocabulary year after year. We have discussed issues like preparedness, medication, risk reduction, recovery efforts, systems, platforms, regulations, legislation, frameworks, financing, sustainability, saving lives, and the list goes on. In other words, we, we seem to have at our disposal the right ingredients so what is stopping us from cooking the right soup or the right broth? Skills, resources, or finances perhaps? I believe we all have different answers unique to our different contexts. Just the other night, over dinner with His Excellency, the Distinguished Director. He shared his idea 
about the possibility, his aspiration of this forum coming up over the years, perhaps with a model that is so dynamic and so that is self-financing, self-sustaining, that can be easily translated into uh, achievable goals. I think because of our different uh, circumstances, our vastly different uh, contexts, this will be a huge challenge. But I sincerely believe this is attainable. Just this morning, we had one of the speakers challenge us with, uh, with the view that if we put our, our heads, our, our efforts, our resources together, we will be able to achieve things. I would like to make a brief reference to one of the this key words from yesterday's vocabulary. And that's about the need for strong leadership and political will to drive change. I strongly believe that overall there is political will. And I can confidently say that for Tuvalu. From yesterday's presentation, uh, presentation also, we were asked whether a multi-stakeholder approach is ideal for our purpose, is ideal for achieving our dream, our goal. And my answer to that question is a very loud yes. Naturally, in time of disasters, we should all stand together and work to help each other and save lives. Not only locally, but with international partners as well. So a multi-stakeholder approach is definitely our best option. And Mr. Moderator, while still on the subject of uh, multi-stakeholder partnerships, I would like to invite all interested partners, and I mean donor partners, in particular who are willing to discuss partnership arrangement with Tuvalu, to please come talk to me. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. I warned you, I told you the ministers are leading by example. They left exactly 25 minutes for you to make your interventions, to ask them questions. So we hope you'll be equally disciplined and uh, keep your comments very short. You indicate by raising your nameplate and then you introduce yourself and then please you go ahead and ask whatever questions you may have. Uh, the floor is open. Is there anybody who would like to ask a question? Or oh, they were so perfect. <laughs> yes, there is, a, there is a hand down there. If you please take the floor. Thank you very much. I represent Kuwait Fund for Arab Economic Development. And uh, my name is Muhammad Sadiqi. And I really uh, sympathize and uh, acknowledge the difficulties of countries post-conflict and disasters because the uh, Kuwait Fund actually goes there post these disasters and conflicts and start uh, working uh, in, with government in assessing the damages so that to identify fields of uh, participation and reduce the impact of these disasters on these countries. What 
we have found, and I am a field uh, engineer, I go there and do the assessment, that we as financiers also, uh, we are burdened sometimes on the government because we ask questions, we need answers, we want to identify projects, priorities, and all these different programs while they are dealing with immediate needs of their uh, of the disasters. Uh, I think the uh, international community, United Nations, and countries that uh, bear these disasters, they have to work in a model so that financiers can come to these countries and they have the information ready, the priorities are ready, so that their intervention can achieve its objectives. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that question. Excellent. Uh, I could take two more questions and then we... Yes, please, over there. Merci pour la parole. Je réponds au nom de Jérôme Ndikulio. Je représente le Burundi. Uh, ma question s'adresse à la plupart gouvernement, mais également aussi à l'intervention de l'Union internationale des télécommunications. Nous sommes en train de parler sur euh, euh, la réponse rapide. Qu'en est-il par rapport à la protection ou à la prévention? Est-ce que nos populations sont sensibilisées par rapport à la protection? Comment faire au moment des urgences? Parce qu'il faut d'abord prévenir, mais aussi il faut répondre pour atténuer les catastrophes. Donc, qu'en est-il par rapport à cette question de prévention dans les États, dans l'éducation de la population, comment se tenir, comment faire Parce qu'il y a euh, des, des solutions par rapport au TIC qui peut coûter moins cher par rapport à la, à la prévention. Je vous remercie. Thank you very much for that question. Uh, we will invite the panelists to share their experiences. Uh, is there another question? Okay, I'm going to invite the ministers. Let me invite the Minister of Antigua and Barbuda before I give the Minister of Somalia. Uh, we talked about the model in the Caribbean for insurance for disaster management. You may want to include that when we talk about financing. I think there was an interesting question coming from uh, the Kuwait Fund, Development Fund. Uh, do you want to react to that? Well, I, yes, I thank you for the opportunity to respond. In respect of the uh, collaboration that takes place within states, in respect of uh, collective security, so far as insurance uh, premiums are concerned, um, it, it, it bodes well for, for the operation of the region. As I said, we are small island developing states and each have a particular small economy. So wherever there is a disaster, the tendency is for the premiums to rise in the following season for that particular country. But because we're all in a common pool, the larger population is able to spread the costs uh, for, for, for that type of intervention. Um, specifically to the question of uh, one in systems. Um, so far as hurricanes are concerned, um, this is an annual event and um, we are linked into the North American um, hurricane uh, tracking system. So we do get frequent meteorological information on the passage, on the formation in the first place, and tracking of hurricanes. And our populations are often well advised, well in advance, and uh, we have systems in terms of the type of preparation that has to be done. Uh, but notwithstanding the preparation and the warnings that will come, um, when the storms prevail, um, they in effect have the ability to disrupt life and living because of the sheer ferocity of these storms. But yes, there is adequate use of social media, as my colleague uh, um, have indicated. There is the broadcast medium as well, the state-owned television and radio. So we do have um, early detection systems so far as that type of uh, disaster is concerned and we also have the ability to offer 
um, information to the public ahead of um, the, the particular um, climatic um, change conditions. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Uh, Minister of Somalia, please. If I can sort of begin with the Kuwait fund uh, part of it, I, I, think, I think those of us that are in a, in a either developing world, post-conflict, post-traumatic uh, experience, uh, we, we do need sort of visionaries like, uh, like you see in the Kuwait fund. Uh, for example, in Somalia this last uh, 12 months, we built out a government broadband network, a fiber optic network. Uh, we've broken ground, in fact, have reached uh, all ministries of the government within eight months um, and our goal is to extend that out to the regional government uh, because we, we want to have below ground secure government communication network uh, so that in the event that flooding happens that uh, towers don't fall and so forth so um, certainly would invite your engineers to come and assess uh, we have two ongoing projects now uh, one with the world bank that is funded uh, quite a bit and also we're starting an African Development Bank which just uh, we've, so our, our sector in terms of ICT is, is growing and has been the only sector that actually grew within 25 years of, of conflict um, and it's something that we're, we're beginning to stabilize so I think visions such as how can financing uh, be made readily, be readily available uh, this sector is something provided that we all make it a multi-use so that if it's a if it's a financing that there's a way to uh, generate some of that money in return um, so if it's a multi-use network that has secure capabilities uh, then the money comes back in terms of capital uh, in terms of investment um, with respect to pre-positioning um, advanced warning I think social media is the is the is the champion um, we, we do a a lot of advanced communications. Um, our uh, the, the 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 crises that uh, outside of the man-made ones that we have are flooding and drought, and thankfully those aren't instant. Uh, we we can kind of see them coming. The El Nino in fact in fact is, is impacting uh, in Somalia. We actually have the very north, which is very rocky and, and sandy, and the south, which is tropical uh, rainforest. So. The, 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 I think the best way to go is to use, is to leverage all communications uh, in terms of radio, in terms of TV, in terms of uh, internet. And I think one, one tool that we use, which is very, very low cost in Somalia that is underestimated, is SMS. Uh, SMS for, for, for Somalia and communicating in a rapid way uh, is, a, is a wonderful tool. And I think, so the, the low end of the spectrum in terms of usage and, and, and technology should not be underestimated. I think yesterday there was a presentation on radio. Uh, these things all matter and it, you know as long as it's a concerted effort. So, Thank you. <laughs> so the, the, the minister says the low end is SMS. I have a lower end which is the human face. So a multi-stakeholder approach where people can actually meet know each other, do simulations and drills, and get to know who is in which organization so that when emergencies do okay, you don't struggle to find Mr. Jones, and when you find him, you can't figure out who of those in a crowd is Mr. Jones. So I think high tech is good, but a more humanitarian approach by humans knowing each other is very critical. Because sometimes when we do events in countries trying to bring uh, all the stakeholders, ambulance people, fire brigade, uh, civil protection, minister of justice because of the temporary convention, the regulator because of regulation, private sector because of uh, technology, they are meeting for the first time, you are introducing them, but you came thousands of kilometers or hundreds of kilometers from somewhere, so we encourage regulators we have nice breakfast meetings with uh, other stakeholders and exchange cards and get to know each other and play golf okay thank you very much uh i don't know whether there is any reaction from here Brood, yes your excellence uh tonga please uh, 
uh, I just want to add to what my colleague said, especially with the question from uh, Perunta. Uh, I think it's not about preparedness is a year-long process. You don't wait until there's a cyclone heading your way to actually try and tell people what to do. So for us, it's a year long, whereby we do drills, we do educational programs through radio, televisions, and what have you. Uh, so it's just something that I think needs to be emphasized, that your preparedness and, and your education is very important, and it's a year long process. It's not when there's a cyclone heading your way. Having said that, uh, one of the disasters that we were still trying to see how we can better respond to is, or better prepare to, is tsunami. I mean, we had tsunami in the Pacific 2009, uh, and we, we, uh, where we think tsunami might be generated around the region, it will only take about 10 to 15 minutes to hit our shores. So we're still trying to see what will be the appropriate mechanism to actually get that warning out, uh, you know, for, for people to start running, for, because most of our, some of our villages are in the coastal areas. So it's still a challenge that we we uh, we still we, we put sirens around the coastal shores, and and one of the challenges for that is making sure that when you send that trigger, that the siren will go off, that nothing is wrong, and then the siren will be silent, and then the people in the waterfront will know that there's a tsunami heading their way. So those are some interesting um, challenges that. We're still trying to sort out, and we're looking forward to discussing further with ITU and other colleagues who may have that uh, experience. Thank you. Th thank you very much, Your Excellency. I think uh, the issue that has been mentioned is quite critical in the sense that uh, sirens will alert people. And what is also even more important is the fact that after the siren, there must be a recorded message that gives clear, short instructions in the local language. Because there was a country where they used the siren, and the siren was very musical, and the kids were dancing. They didn't know that it was for an emergency. So when you add, after that, clear instructions for people to evacuate, and to tell them where to go in the language they understand, it is very important. And uh, as His Excellency, the Deputy Prime Minister said, it is an ongoing process. It's not a one-off. You must continuously educate the people. I see there is a hand here, the Minister of Zambia. Um, I, I just want to address the frustration uh, shown by the the gentleman who talked about uh, uh, Kuwait uh, fund towards the people that require the help. Um, I, I share maybe that frustration with him. But I would like to request uh, that in that case, isn't it possible that maybe ITU can take up this problem and, and see to it that people in each country uh, are trained to tailor to the needs when they request for financial help, and, and then a donor comes and just goes back. I, I'd like to ask that question, is it possible? Th th thank you very much, uh, Minister. I, I confirm it is possible, and on behalf of uh, the Secretary General and the Director of the Development Bureau, certainly we will do that. You saw our model IFCE, ITU Framework for Cooperation and Emergencies, uh, we promote this kind, and please feel free afterwards to contact us. We know the concerns when you are financing the sovereign risk uh, assessment and uh, policy reversal, the danger of that, and so forth. We will be able to, to work with you, and we are continuously hunting and growing partnerships. And please don't hesitate after this, we can, we can have a meeting. Uh, I think, yes, the last word, uh, Dr. Mlambo. Just um, read here. It says, 10 years, that is the um, Sendao Declaration. 10 years after the adoption of the Yogo uh, framework of action, disasters continue to undermine efforts in achieving a sustainable development. The question again um, is, is why? Despite the high-tech 
that there is in this in this world. People will continue to die. Uh, in Hiroshima um, last year, we learned that ICTs can go a long way in alleviating um, um, disaster. But uh, disaster still okay. Now for countries like uh, mine, which is Zimbabwe, let me again isolate one teething problem which we seem to see. Lack of awareness at several levels, starting from the political uh, level, which you know, makes things happen to the operational guys. And then down to those who will be handling equipment, in the case of uh, perhaps Iridium satellite terminals. Now, then you, 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 you take multi-stick uh, scenarios and you, you factor it into the entire picture I'm trying to define. Do all these coalesce to, to enable the work happen and happen on time. Let us say you have 15 multi-stakeholders from government departments, non-governmental, and um, multinational corporations, one hold, right down to traditional chiefs. Every level has different understanding of what you want to do. Traditional chiefs don't quite understand. They might want to appeal to the spirits and then uh, other leaders might want to first inform ancestors in people are dying. If people are marooned in an island and the river is swelling up, to talk about um, floods in, in, in Zimbabwe, or high wind fires are about in Gulf people and there is an alarm that this is what is happening here. In the meantime, you're getting together this large group and you say, let's move in. Uh, it's a common sight in quite a number of developing countries that you get to a site if it is fire with um, firefighting equipment with no water and you, you realize when you're on site there that there's no water then you rush back and by the time they come back with the drums full of water people have died because of lack of uh, coordination. I want to come back to ITU that um, there is really has to be an effort to, to train people special on the drills. Let's not wait for the fire because fire occurs every year and people keep on dying every year. We know in advance that there will be fire next year, 12 months before. But come the 12 months, people still die with that equipment and the people in offices. And sometimes also some departments take that department as areas of turf and uh, they, they, they see an attempt to solicit for coordination, cooperation, cohesion in fighting a disaster as interference in their attempt, which goes back to lack of awareness uh, about these uh, disasters. So for countries like us, ITU, perhaps we need to concentrate on a lot of awareness at different levels. If it is equipment, it is themselves, for example, that was denoted to Zimbabwe, some of them are stationed there in somebody's high office as a status symbol. Uh, but as a runner, it doesn't even understand that but as a runner, that thing no longer works. Because of, again, lack of awareness of what that unit is supposed to do and drills to practice using the thing and the simulations of disaster to coordinate all these multi-sector, uh, multi-stakeholders to, 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 to generate an action into to make things happen. Uh, so, so I tell you, I think given um, the work you're doing, there's that sector, there's that um, focus you need to, to, to make, to make people implement uh, resolutions we come out of conferences with. Thank you. At this point, I would like to thank you for listening and also for asking questions and participating in this discussion. Having said that, it would not have been possible if the ministers had not accepted to come and also to share their wisdom with us. So please, can we just give them another round of applause? So I would like to thank the, uh, the interpreters for their patience because we ran uh, into their time a little bit. Thank you very much for that. And let me, before I hand over to the chairman, I'm going to summarize for you the session as I got it. The following points were repeated by the ministers, and I think they are very important. First of all, 
we have to adopt a multi-stakeholder approach. Second, we have to adopt a multi-sectoral approach because it is not only the technology, but it is what you do with it that matters. Third, it is a multi-hazard, multidisciplinary approach because you need a specialist after the disaster. It may be traumatic. When it is traumatic, you need a psychologist to give counseling. You need a teacher to educate those kids who are at crash or kindergarten level so that they grow up with a culture of disaster risk reduction and disaster management. The unique needs of small island developing states, least developed countries, and other countries that have special needs have got to be highlighted. But not forgetting the faces behind those countries, people with a disability, the elderly, and other special groups. Gender issue, those are critical elements that we have to take on board. Climate change is a reality. Climate change impacts all of us. Climate change will continue. And it is important for us to mitigate the impact, but also to try to adapt. If you were growing a certain variety of a crop and the rains are coming late, it is time we migrate to a new set of crops that will withstand drought and also rain season that comes late. Resilience in terms of communities, in terms of institutions, in terms of telecommunication networks, redundancy in terms of the telecommunication networks are critical. Connectivity is an issue. Those in urban areas, that's why statistics sometimes lie a little bit, because you may have 100% penetration, but dominated by people in the urban areas and semi-urban. Those in the rural communities who constitute pretty much in the developing world, 70% of the population, and mainly are women, are not captured in the equation. So connectivity, bridging the digital divide in a responsible manner is important. One of the ministers mentioned the cost of airtime that those who provide the service should be a little bit more sensitive to the needs. You cannot pour water on a drowning mouse. You cannot pour water on those who are already suffering. So give a lending hands. And we thank again those partners that have been supporting and working with ITU for the benefit of the member states. They have been contributing a lot of resources and we invite you to consider it's money that is going for a just cause. An issue that has something to do with financing is the marriage between ICT for development and ICT for disaster management. So that you set up infrastructure, you use the same infrastructure to develop communities, to achieve the 17 sustainable development goals on time, but at the same time saving communities. So those same persons using those systems for development will use it to save lives. So it is important they become the first responders. Another issue, capacity building, and IT was called a number of times, we have to do more. Training people, rehearsing, hands-on training with the different kinds of equipment. Now with big data, we are moving towards machine-to-machine -to -machine communication. By some estimation, today, we have about 25 billion devices that are talking to each other without human intervention. And we estimate by 2020, we will have probably 65 billion devices talking to each other. It is important for us to build the capacity and to see how best we can use those emerging technologies to serve humanity. Technology without a human face is a fallacy. And finally, one of the ministers summed it up, and I will use his words so that you don't accuse me of plagiarism. He said, strong leadership and political will are the key elements. That's why we have the ministerial roundtable, so that we hear from the third leaders. When we finish, we are having a group photo for the participants, and I will hand over the floor to, to the chairman, if you could just remain standing. But thank you very much for your participation.